Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Parks Adventure Crossing America. So today we're at the Vicksburg National Military Park in Vicksburg, Mississippi. A special thanks to the National Park Foundation for their collaboration. And we are here with Ranger Taylor. Ranger Taylor, thank you so much. It was raining a little bit earlier and now the sun's coming out. So thanks so much for having us here today. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, before we start talking about this place, can you tell me how you got into the national parks? Now, I already know, but it's a little different than other people. So let's talk about that. It is a little different um, in that this really is the only national park that I've ever worked at. And that's kind of a rarity in the park service. Many people have be bopped around to many different parks, but I feel very blessed to be able to say that I was able to uh, begin my career here and have since continued it. Um, I started here as a pathway student intern, which I highly recommend for any of the students out there if they're interested in the park service. Service. The Pathways program is a great one. Um, I was able to complete my master's degree through that program and I guess they liked me well enough because they decided to keep me around um, and now I get to do exactly what I've always wanted to do my whole life which is inspire other kids um, to love history in the way that I was inspired when I was a child. What did you study in college that brought you here? Uh, well, I studied public history, which um, is the study of how to do history for the general public. Okay. So while you do learn um, what a historian would learn, which is all, you know, the primary source research, how to do archival research and how to write, um, what you primarily focus on is how do I take all this information, this scholarly information, and make it applicable to the general public and help them to find a connection with it and an appreciation for it. Um, so that's what I do. So I think that's a great match for what you're doing today and what we're actually trying to do with kids all around the country. So thanks for following that path and for being here today. <laughs> yes, you're so welcome. I love what I do. Let's just begin. Where are we? Um, and just tell us about this place and some of the significance of the place where we're standing. Okay, um, so right now we are in the middle of the battlefield here at Vicksburg National Military Park. Um, we're at Battery de Goyer, which was a Union battery that was set up um, once the siege of Vicksburg began. Um, so what's really unique about Vicksburg is a couple things actually. First, this park is right in the city of Vicksburg. Um, there are many other Civil War parks where these battlefields would have been um, miles outside of a city, um, expansive, flat pieces of land that these battles were fought on. But here at Vicksburg, really it happened in the city and it affected civilians as much as it affected soldiers. And you can also see here that our battlefield is different in its landscape, its topography. If you look out across the battlefield, you see lots of rolling hills. Um, while some of it is from manipulation of the soldiers at the time of the war, um, a lot of that is natural. When the Union Army arrived here at Vicksburg, they would have seen topography very similar to this. So you can imagine how difficult that would have been for them running across the battlefield, carrying all of their really heavy equipment, trying to assault Confederate fortifications here. Um, but really when we talk about what made Vicksburg so important? Why was a national park set up here? Um, it really was because Vicksburg was a defining moment in the American Civil War. Um, here in Vicksburg, we do sit on the Mississippi River, which is arguably the most recognizable, well-known river in the United States, which at that time operated as a super highway. Uh, so I always tell the kids today we have 
our highways with our semi trucks and they bring us um, different goods like medicine, clothes, food, things like that. Well, at the time, the river systems and waterways would have been um, how people here and throughout the country got all of the supplies that they needed to live. And so Vicksburg sits right here as a major port city on the Mississippi River. Um, and it was important in that it was the final major port city that was under control of the Confederacy, um, while it and uh, Port Hudson down in Louisiana. Um, but Vicksburg was really the final major port city. And um, if the Union were to obtain it, it would complete what was known as the Anaconda Plan, which was a plan put forward at the beginning of the Civil War by Winfield Scott. And the idea was if the Union Navy could take each major port of the Confederacy and block it off, then they would be able to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. If you don't have access to goods like uniforms, food, ammunition, you really don't have an army. Uh, you could have the men, but you got to feed them, right? Right. Um, so that was the idea. Um, and both Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy, and um, also Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States of America, they noted that Vicksburg was very important. Um, in fact, President Abraham Lincoln notes that Vicksburg is the key. And it is said that he said, uh, we will not win the war until that key is firmly in our pocket. So both sides knew Vicksburg was important, which is why they were very intent on keeping control of it, while the Confederacy keeping control and the Union Army wanted it really badly. Who were the major players? So let's talk about the, the people that led both sides at that time. So um, the Confederacy, uh, the defense here at Vicksburg was headed up by uh, General John C. Pemberton. Um, and then the Union Army was headed by um, General Ulysses S. Grant, who of course everybody knows Grant. Um, he was here at Vicksburg. So set this up for us. Um, when did things start happening here? Um, so here at Vicksburg, the Vicksburg campaign, um, you could really say started in December of 1862 with the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, um, which was an attempt made by um, the Union Army, uh, which was headed up by uh, William T. Sherman, his corps was here. Um, they attempted to take Vicksburg from the north through Swampland. Um, it didn't work out too well for them. Of course, we sit here on very high bluffs, which are a benefit to the Confederate defense. Um, if you are fighting a battle, you always want the high ground, and the Confederates had the high ground. Um, so the Union Army was repulsed then. It was back to the drawing board. I mean, eventually, after several failed attempts, it ends up um, in this culmination of events brings Grant to this moment of realization where he figures out that the only way to get Vicksburg is going to be through an overland campaign through the state of Mississippi. Um, so he does decide to march his army south through Louisiana on the opposite side of the Mississippi River, um, where he crosses his troops at a city called Bruinsburg, which actually no longer exists today. Um, he crosses his entire Union Army into Mississippi, and then they march deep through enemy territory, fighting battle after battle after battle um, before they make it here to Vicksburg. In fact, they go through five different battles um, as they push the Confederates back behind the fortification here at Vicksburg. They arrive here on um, May 19th, 1863. Um, they launch an assault. Um, again, William T. Sherman's Corps launches an assault the northern end of our park on the Stockade Redan, um, and it is a failure. Um, when Grant got here, he thought, you know, we're going to take this city. We defeated them five times already. I'm ready to have Vicksburg. This was a major goal of his, was to take the city of Vicksburg. Um, but those Confederate fortifications, they just, they were too much for them. I mean, you've got towering um, walls of earth and massive pits in front of them that these men have to get over. And not to mention, of course, we discussed the topography already. And you've got these rolling hills, and it's really not conducive for the type of battle that they were used to, which again was just straight lines and assaulting. Right. Um, so he attempts to take the city on the 19th. That fails. Um, he gets all of his men here. They set up a nine-mile siege line, and he decides on May 22nd at exactly 10 o'clock in the morning, they are going to launch an all-out assault 
on every fortification that the Confederates have here. And again, it fails. It's at that point that Grant realizes, I'm not gonna be able to fight my way into this city, and he decides to lay siege. So the beginning of the siege we note as May 18th, 1863, the day before that first assault, and it does last for 47 days. Um, and it does end in a Confederate surrender. The Union does take the city on July 4th, 1863, um, but not before trenches are dug all over the battlefield here. You've got sharpshooter fire and artillery fire that lasts for 47 days. One thing that's really important to note at our park is that it wasn't just soldiers that were affected, civilians were heavily affected mm -hmm. here as well. And that's something that's very unique here in our story is that you think about a siege and when you really think about it, the things that it did and how it affected um, innocent bystanders really within the city of Vicksburg for 47 days, they were without food, water, proper medical, they had to endure listening to artillery bombardment essentially 24 hours a day. Um, and what they did for protection here is they ended up digging caves all throughout the city of Vicksburg. Um, it was known as Prairie Town because, you know, prairie dogs yeah. have their holes and they pop out of them. If you were here then and you were in the city, you would have seen earthen caves dug everywhere. And this is where civilians chose to take shelter during that artillery bombardment. Um, they did attempt to make it as homey as possible, bringing beds inside and games for the children to play and lamps and lanterns. Um, but in the end, they uh, are some civilians are noted as saying it felt as if they were suffocating in an earthen tomb. So here on these grounds where we are today, is there anything that is standing that is original to the time when this battle took place? Yes, uh, there actually is only one building on our battlefield that is a pre-Civil War structure, and it's actually behind us here. Um, it is called the Shirley House, um, and it is where we interpret our civilian story, how the siege affected them. Um, it was saved by Adeline Shirley, who was um, the mistress of the house. Um, on May 18th, as the Confederates were retreating back after their five losses throughout this campaign, they're retreating back behind the fortifications here at Vicksburg, and um, it's a mad scramble. And they were ordered to burn down any building that stood in front of these fortifications. So right now, here we are in Vicksburg, we are in the middle of the city. At that time, it would have kind of been considered the countryside, and our Shirley house would have been a country home with beautiful gardens, plants everywhere, children running around, just really pristine. Um, so they're ordered to burn them down. This, of course, is so that the Union Army doesn't have any shelter. They can't hide behind anything. They can't sleep in any shelter. They don't have anywhere for headquarters or medical. Um, the Confederate who was ordered to burn down the Shirley house walks up to the porch and is met on the front porch by Miss Adeline Shirley, who begs and pleads with him for a while to please do not burn down my house. She's watching all of her outbuildings burn around her. I'm sure you can imagine this would have been quite the frightening scene. It's just fire and brimstone all around you. Um, and the one last thing you have to save is your house um, that you've spent many happy years in. Uh, so she's arguing with this soldier and the legend says that as he moves his arm to put the torch to her house, they hear a gunshot and he's hit right in the chest. And when they look over, they see the Union Army coming up the road. A Union sharpshooter had gotten him um, and he did die before he could burn the house down. Um, so Miss Adeline Shirley's begging and pleading really saved her house. And it's really important because it saved it for all of us too. Right. We have this wonderful cultural resource to learn from today. So I'm so glad that Miss Shirley did that so we have this here but there's also lots of other monuments and memorials around here and I think that kind of gives you guys some bragging rights so tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> it does. Um, we one thing that um, we hold the title for here is we are the most monumented park in the National Park Service. We have over 1400 different monuments and memorials and markers in our park. Um, and a lot of it, you see a lot of um, state monuments that were put in in the early 20th century. 
um, by the different states that had soldiers who fought in the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, many of them are done in the American Renaissance style, which was very popular then. In fact, we have one which is the largest and most recognizable one on our battlefield right behind us here, the beautiful Illinois Monument. Um, so we are noted as being the art park of the world, as one veteran apparently called us at some point in time. And um, we have been recognized as one of the largest outdoor art museums in the entire world as well. Well, can just anyone come in and put something up? I'm sure there's a process with that, right? Yes, um, please do not come in and put anything up. <laughs> there is definitely a process. Um, when the park was founded in 1899, um, each state that was involved in the Vicksburg campaign was able to select a spot on the battlefield where their state monument would go. Um, and there's actually only one spot left. Um, the state of Kentucky, um, because of course they were a border state, so they had men who fought on both sides of the conflict. They were granted three different spots for their monument. They were granted one spot right in the middle of the battlefield where they could put a Kentucky state monument. And then they had spots on either side of the siege lines, one for the a Confederate Memorial and another for a Union Memorial. And actually the Union Memorial for Kentucky is the only open spot on our battlefield. So what was the last memorial monument that was erected here? That, that would be the Kentucky Confederate Memorial, the one that we were just discussing. Um, but all of our monuments do get upgrades. Uh, we actually just a couple years ago had the Mississippi Monument uh, got refurbished and we had a big rededication ceremony for it. Our Missouri Monument had the same thing a few years back um, for its 100th anniversary. So you have to take care of these monuments and memorials. You probably have maintenance people here and historical architecture. Um, folks that come around and look, but you also have other stuff here. You have natural resources. We do. And did I hear you have some challenges with invasive species here? We do, yes. We do have such a beautiful battlefield here, so pristine, so lovely. But like any other national park in the National Park Service, we do struggle with invasive species. Um, and we have some invasive plant species here and also animal and insect species. I saw some of those just right in front of us. I I'm know, keeping yes. an eye out. <laughs> yes, we have to make sure they don't get too close. Um, yes, fire ants are such a huge problem here for us. They are invasive throughout the whole southeastern United States um, and they really do pose a problem for um, not only staff but also our visitors as well. You come here to enjoy the battlefield but you always have to be watching out for those um, because they are hidden, sometimes difficult to find, and they will get you. Well I have some kids that might be interested in solving this problem. So kids for the sake of Dr. Drizzle here, who does not want to get stung, actually bit and stung, bit I and learned stung, yes. from uh, Ranger Taylor. We want you to think about some ideas that could help the National Park Service take care of these invasive species. They're, they're not wanted here. Um, is it hard to get rid of invasive species? Absolutely, we know that from our work all around the country. But we're gonna use goal number 15, which is life on land. And we want you to come up with some ideas for how the National Park Service can eliminate, accept, or redirect these ants into some other place. As the song goes, we need the ants to go marching two by two off of this battlefield. So you could come up with a social media campaign to get people to make sure they're keeping their eyes out for these so that we sort of, they're here and we're gonna protect ourselves. Or you could come up with some ideas for how the National Park Service could relocate, move these ants so that they're not a problem. We want you to do some research. Now these are not your typical ants. From what I heard from Ranger Taylor, they bite and as they hang on to you, they also sting. So this is something we just don't want around here. Um, and I bet there's some other states in the South that would appreciate your ideas. Make sure that you share your ideas or your prototypes for some traps, whatever you want to think of with expeditions and education. We want you also to uh, tag Crossing America. Make sure you tag the National Park Foundation and don't forget to tag Vicksburg National Military Park because they have scientists here and researchers and resource people that would be interested in knowing 
how you would be able to get rid of these for the park. I don't know this, but they might even put up a monument for you if you come up with a really, really good idea. As you know, we have a lot of students that watch these from kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade. Yeah. And a lot of them, this is cool. They're very interested in history or science, but there's a large amount of them that want that hat. They <laughs> want hat. your job someday. So <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, if you can look in the camera, stay away from the ants. Okay. Look in the camera and give them a little bit of advice. My advice, if you want to wear this hat someday, is to get out to your national parks. Go talk to other rangers, talk to volunteers, ask them how they also got to be in the spot that I'm in today. Maybe find a volunteer opportunity with your family. Um, go out and help the national parks in any way that you can. But most importantly, never stop dreaming and work hard. I love that. We, we always say in Expeditions and Education that when your passion intersects your purpose, you have found your spot for life. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us here. I didn't realize we were going to be standing near ants, but you did a good job of protecting us, and we really appreciate you allowing us to be here today. Yes, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you being here so much. So on behalf of the National Park Foundation, the Vicksburg National Military Park, Dr. Drizzle and Ranger Taylor. We're out of here, guys. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.